you glad you have those experiences with God that you know He is real? Now, I know we don't live by experiences, but I'm thankful that I have an experience to, to look back on. Amen? And uh, that's funny because I guess we're going to be actually talking about a little bit of that tonight. Well, did you miss last week's not being able to be here? Amen. Well, that actually gave me a chance to, to go ahead, jump ahead, and get some other things studied and started. And so what we're doing tonight now is we are going with part number two, which would be week number four. And we do have the notes up here if you need them for week number four. Tonight will be week number four. Because um, two weeks ago we did start Genesis, correct? Right? Okay. All right. Just making sure I, I'm not off. But uh, so there's more pens, paper, notes uh, up here. And real quick, let me just say this as ways of announcements. Uh, we have been talking with Bishop Webb, and he will be here next Friday night, the 15th. And so Bishop Webb will be here, and then we have a special treat for you, Dr. Sheila Isom. How many remember Dr. Sheila Isom? She will be with us that Sunday morning as well. So that next weekend, not this weekend, but next weekend is going to be just a powerful time. Bishop Webb will be here Friday night, the 15th, and then Dr. Sheila Isom will be with us in the morning service on Sunday the 17th. And so write that down. I know that's short notice, but, man, you just got to roll with Bishop Webb. When he gets an open date, you just got to go with him because uh, he, he's in demand. He goes all across the nation preaching and teaching. He just had done some uh, television shows with uh, Jim Baker down in Branson, Missouri, and so uh, I caught him in between tapings, and so we've got that scheduled for next Friday. All right. Now, uh, Guess what? I don't know if we're going to get through Genesis tonight or not. Uh, I have a lot. I know just about how many pages it takes me to go through in about, you know, 45, 50 minutes. And I've got more pages than what I normally would. So we may or may not get through Genesis tonight. If we don't, we will finish right up next week. Is that all right? It would probably be just a few minutes and then we'll start Exodus. We will start Exodus next week no matter what. It will be at either at the beginning of the service or mid part through the service because I just have a lot of things here I want to say about Genesis and so uh, just bear with us is that all right I, th I think I think we need to get the beginning right don't you yeah. and obviously like we said Genesis is the beginning of all things but as we began to find out a couple weeks ago uh, the book of Genesis is a pretty amazing book how many would say amen to that wow it's just simply an amazing book have you had a chance to go back and reread some of Genesis Man, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in Genesis. It's filled with many twists, uh, epic events, and even some surprises here and there. Uh, but Genesis gives us a record of at least 2,000 years of human history. Amen. Isn't that wild to think that one book covers 2,000 years? But it does. And, so, uh, and to put that time frame kind of into perspective, let's break it down here uh, this evening. Because we know that from Adam to Jesus... There were approximately 4,000 years of time. From Adam to Jesus, there were approximately 4,000 years of time. And then from Jesus to right now, where we live here and today in 2019, there has uh, been approximately 2,000 years. And so that gives us somewhere in the ballpark of 6,000 years of human history as we know it. And uh, how many knows that it took Jesus six days? To create the earth, and on the seventh day, he what? Rested. He rested. So if a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day, where does that put us? Yeah. Right on the precipice of the seventh day, the Sabbath. And so we know that this thing is just about over. How many can say amen to that? Thank God for that, amen. Now, long before God gave the law to Moses, and that's in Exodus chapter 20, we're not even there yet. But long before God did that, we find several different ordinances, not laws, but ordinances given in the book of Genesis. And we're going to look at a few of them here tonight. At the very beginning, we see that God instituted the Sabbath. Everybody say the Sabbath. We just talked about that. The Sabbath. And you can find that in Genesis chapter 2, verses number 1 through 3. And then he instituted marriage. Everybody say marriage. And we're going to talk about marriage here in a little bit. He instituted the Sabbath, and then he instituted marriage, and you can find marriage in chapter 2, verse number 24. And then we see the unwritten law of the tithe. Everybody say the tithe. 
The tithe was being observed as well, even in the Old Testament. And we can read about that in Genesis chapter 14, verse number 20, as well as Genesis chapter 28, verse number 22. But from the very beginning, God has been teaching His people that they are only stewards. Everybody say stewards. They are only stewards of everything that they have. How many understand that everything you have in a possession, you really don't own it, you're just borrowing it? Right? Because when we leave this earth, guess what? We're going to leave it the same way we came, naked. Amen? The only thing we can take with us is Jesus. Somebody say, somebody say the only thing we can take with us is Jesus. Amen? So God has been teaching His people from day one to be faithful stewards of what they have been given. Now, the civilization before the flood is called the Antidelivian Civilization. And it perished in the judgment of the flood. Has anybody read about the flood here the last couple weeks? Wow, we got a message brewing about the flood. I've got, I've got about 10 messages on the back burner right now going over all these Old Testament stories. I'm loving it. But I'm just seeing things. Of, how many are seeing things in a new, fresh light this time as you read through some of these Old Testament books? I am. I'm just, I'm loving it. It's given me a lot of sermon material for Sunday. So, uh, this was the civilization started by Cain and may have been equal to that of Greece or of Rome. But yet it ended in destruction because God's judgment was upon it. You know, I, as we were watching the uh, State of the Union speech last night, I just couldn't help but think what a, what a time, what a season we are as a nation. And I was reminded of that scripture. It says, uh, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And uh, what does it say? It says sin is a reproach to any people. And I'm amazed at how we read through the Old Testament here and we just see the children of Israel. They would serve God for a while. Then they would go back to worshiping idols. Then God would send judgment and then they would get right and be blessed for a little while. And they'd go back to serving idols. And uh, my goodness, I, I tell you what, I'm just so glad I don't live in the Old Testament. But I'm thankful for grace, and, I, and I'm thankful, I think, that we have a little bit better understanding. How many would say amen to that? I, I think we have a little bit better understanding of things. Obviously, we have the entire Bible now in our possession. But uh, the Bible does say that these things were written for our examples. And so we need to learn, don't we? We need to learn from other people's examples. And so I'm just, I'm amazed at all the things we're reading again. Now, speaking of the flood, we know that Noah and his family, uh, the eight souls, they were the only people on the earth to make it through the flood. Wow, isn't that amazing? Now, I really didn't look up to see how many people they guesstimated were on the earth at that time, but I, I promise you it was a lot of people still. But only eight souls were saved through the flood. And they were saved by how? The ark. The ark. And uh, we also know that Noah preached while he, while he built the ark for 120 years. Now that's a long time. You know, we talk about being here in Lincoln for 42 years, and that's a long time. But man, 120 years. And not only that, uh, but how many understand that Noah's message was pretty crazy? Hello? I said his message was pretty crazy considering the fact that it had never rained before, but yet he's saying that the earth is going to be destroyed because of a flood. Now, let's be real. If you were an inhabitant of the earth back in Noah's day, would you have believed a crazy man building the ship saying it's going to flood and destroy the earth? Wow. Wow. But we know that the ark was one of the Old Testament shadows or examples of the Christ to come. And uh, when Noah came out of the ark, the first thing he did was what? That's it. The very first thing Moses or Noah did, rather, when he came out of the ark was he erected an altar and worshiped the Lord. Out of the fearful judgment of the earth by the flood, God saved only eight people. And then... He gave them the purified earth to these eight people with ample power to govern it. 
And he kind of shifts gears here. And let's look at it real quick in Genesis chapter 9. And he knows things are going to be different this time. And so he sets it up a little different. Let's look at it in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. In other words, get busy having babies, right? And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moves upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely your blood of your lives... Will, will require at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So what we see is he's trying to deal with the first murder, and we talked about that a couple weeks ago when Cain killed his brother Abel, and so God is trying to set some physical boundaries or laws into place, and he's wanting man to learn how to govern himself. How many know we're still having a problem trying to govern ourselves? 6,000 years later, and we still really don't have it figured out, do we? Oh my, let's not even go there. That's a whole nother, whole nother subject. But, so, for the first time, God gave people human government. People were now to be responsible for governing the world for God. And in doing so, the most solemn responsibility that God gives man was the taking of a life for a life. And that's what we just read here in Genesis chapter 9. So then, after the flood, the world was given a new start. How many like new starts, fresh starts? That was our first sermon of the year, right? A fresh start, new, time for a, a new beginning. But instead of spreading out and repopulating the earth as God commanded them, the main body of Noah's descendants seemed to have migrated from Armenia, exactly where Noah's family left the ark. Isn't that just like humankind to just mess stuff up? It was back toward the plain of Babylonia, where they built the great tower of Babel, which was in total defiance of God. Amen? Somehow they thought they could establish a worldwide empire that would be independent of God. Boy, does that sound familiar to us here today. Aren't we trying to do that right now still? Trying to live our lives totally uh, independent of God, not dependent on God but independent of God. How many know we need to be dependent on God? All right. And because of that, the human race was then divided at the Tower of Babel into nations. And those nations spoke different languages according to Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem's sons settled in Arabia to the east, while Ham's sons settled in Africa, and Japheth's sons settled in Europe. Now, we've said that Genesis hinted that a Savior would come, a Messiah. And the first prophecy of the coming Messiah is found here in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. I want us to look at that. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. And he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and it shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So, we find in the book of Genesis that because of one man's sin, Adam, death began to reign over the entire human race. We see that in Romans. We see that in the New Testament. Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, because remember the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin are death, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. 
for that all have sinned. Hmm. But, on the other hand, ah, how many know that one man brought hope and salvation, <laughs> and that was the second Adam, who was Jesus the Christ. Can somebody say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for the second Adam. Amen. amen. And we find that in John chapter 3, verse number 16 and 17. For God so loved the world. There it is, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. So in other words, what Adam number one couldn't do, Adam number two did. Come on, somebody. How many are thankful you serve a God who can do for you what you can't do for yourself? Come on now. I feel like preaching right now. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God we serve. The God of the impossible. Amen? For what's impossible with man is possible with God. Amen? Now, since we're in the book of Genesis here, I think it would be good if we just kind of ask this question right here. How do we know that the Bible is true? I mean, I understand that as believers, we accept it. We exercise that childlike faith, that measure of faith that we've all been given, and we believe it. But how many know that's our choice, right? We choose to do that. But how do we know, really, that the Bible is true? Well, let's list a couple things here. First of all, number one, history. Everybody say history. And how many times have we already said that in this Bible study? What is history? His story. That's what history is. It's his story. So we know that the Bible is true simply from history. They are always finding new proof that the Bible is real. Number two, prophecy. Many things prophesied in the Bible have already come to pass. Right? How many knew that Jesus' first coming was prophesied in the Old Testament? Well, guess what? If he came the first time, then that means he's coming the second time. So prophecy, another reason why we know the Bible is true. Number three, miracles. The supernatural. How can you explain away miracles? Come on, somebody. Mm, the Bible is full of miracles. How many know we serve a supernatural God? And you know what? It's hard to dispute a miracle, isn't it? It is. It is. Number four, experience. Now, we just talked about that earlier. Experience. How many have experienced Bible salvation? The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. We've already said it in this study. We've got to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Look at your neighbor and say, you've got to experience this thing, honey. I can't explain to you how good butter pecan ice cream is or a Fort Worth ribeye steak. Is. Where, 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 where's that from? Texas Roadhouse. I can't explain that to you. You've got to go eat one for yourself, right? Experience. It's hard, it's hard to argue with somebody who's had an experience. How many has enco encountered God? Have you, had, have you had a God encounter? We just talked about it at the beginning of the service. Man, I love God encounters. Woo. And then number five, the Dead Sea Scrolls. They help prove what we already knew, that the Bible is real. Amen? The Bible is real. Somebody say that. The Bible is real. The Bible is real. Now, we mentioned prophecy here in this list. And we know that the Bible says that the day will come when prophecies will what? Cease. The day will come when prophecies will cease. But how many understand that day hasn't come yet? No, that day's not come yet. Because prophecies are still being given and prophecies are still coming to pass. Now that's important because we've talked about it already in this study. The Logos, the written word of God, and the reign of the spoken word of God. And how many understand the God who inspired this book right here is still speaking to men and women. Come on. And not only is he speaking through his Logos, the written, but he's speaking through his Rhema, the spoken word of God. Amen? And so that day hasn't come when prophecies will cease, but we're still living in the day of the prophets. How many would say amen? And the prophets is one of the, office, the, one of the offices that God is restoring. How many believe that the fivefold ministry is being restored back into the church in these last days? I promise you it is. I promise you it is. But look at this. We're talking about prophecy right now. John chapter 14, verse 29. And now, I have told you before, it come to pass. Before it come to pass, I told you. That when it has come to pass, you might believe. There it is. So it's not just to prepare us or it's to give us a heads up but it's to give us a proof or an example or a confirmation that, hey, this thing's real. 
Right? How many have had a prophetic word spoken to you and then later it came to pass? Wow, isn't that amazing? I love when that happens. Or, or how many have ever had your mail read by somebody? It's like, whoo, how'd you know that? That was God. That was God. So this, this thing is real, isn't it? Amen? Now, uh, the word Genesis means beginning, as we know. And that's important because I believe that if we get Genesis right, we'll get the rest of the Bible right. Okay? If we can understand how things began, then I believe we can understand why things are the way they are. Do you get that? Let me say that again. If we can understand how things began, then we can understand why things happen the way they happen. Because there's, there's some kind of beat or rhythm or we kind of we got a heads up, right? Okay, that's what Genesis is all about. It's like we said a couple of weeks ago. How can we know where we're going until we know where we've been? Right? I mean, we're all about pressing forward and pushing and believing God for bigger and better things. But, hey, we need to know who we are and where we came from and what our genesis was, right? Because if we, listen, if we don't get all this right, then we don't have the correct identity of who we are. Right? And we'll never have a correct identity of who we are until we have a revelation of who he is. And then once we get a revelation of who he is, then we'll figure out who we are in the kingdom. Come on, somebody. Right? All right, so let's get it right. And that's why we've started in Genesis. Amen? Now, quickly, let's talk about uh, the six days of creation. And I know this is kind of elementary, dear Watson, but we'll just kind of fly through it here real quick. On the first day, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And he called the light day and the darkness he called night. Now, I want you to notice as we go through these days of creation, God is just speaking things into existence, okay? And then we'll move on to something else, and you'll see the difference. But on the second day, God made the firmament, which is the sky or the heavens, and then he separated the water above from the waters beneath. And the waters beneath would be the seas and the oceans, the lakes, the rivers, the streams, and so on. And the water above would be the clouds, or the dew, or the humidity, because remember, before the flood, it had never rained before, right? So things had to get watered somehow. So I really don't know what was going on there without any rain. Some think that there was some kind of cloud mist of screen. You know, I I don't know what all there was, but God separated the waters from below from the waters above. All right, that was the second day. On the third day, he created the grass. How many's ready to see the green grass again this spring? Man, we're going to appreciate spring this year, aren't we? He created the grass, the vegetation, and the trees. On the fourth day, he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. How many know we just had another sign in the heavens here a couple weeks ago? The uh, lunar eclipse, and it was a full blood moon, wasn't it? I think it was a wolf, wolf moon or something it was called. And so, uh, man, I tell you what, we could just spend some time there, but we, we don't have time to do that. It's just another sign. And then on the fifth day, he created the fish. Uh, this, all the animals of the sea and the birds. And then guess what? Look at your neighbor and say, he saved the best for last. <laughs> On the sixth day, God created the animals and man. And man. I was talking about man, not the animals. <laughs> and if you recall, God gave Adam the job of naming all the animals. Have you ever thought about how Adam came up with all those names? hippopotamus. Do you really think Adam knew how to spell hippopotamus? Do you think he really cared? (laughs) Giraffe. Where'd he come up with that? But it's just amazing the creativity that God puts in us as human beings. Isn't that true? That creativity. And so on the sixth day, he created the animals and mankind. And then finally, on the seventh day, what did he do? God rested. Now, did he rest because he was tired? No, God never sleeps or slumbers, but he rested as an example to us that on the seventh day we rest, that we honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy, right? But now remember, all these days of creation, God simply spoke everything into existence, but when it came to man, oh, come on, somebody. When it came to man, 
He had to get this one right. He, he took matters into his own hands. Everybody say he took matters into his own hands. Look at this, and I'm going to have to stand up for this. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man did what? Man became a living soul. Could you imagine what that looked like? The God of the universe kneeling down and taking the dirt, the dust of the earth and forming us. Wow. I just, I can't even imagine. And then he breathed into man's nostrils and man became a living soul. Wow. Wow. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, we see a verification of this. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return. Here it is, till you return unto the ground. So that's just another confirmation that we came from the ground. For out of it were you taken, from dust you are, and to dust shall you return. Oh, my goodness. But how many are thankful that we don't have to judge our worth by our dirt? <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, don't judge your worth by your dirt. Amen? Because this isn't the real me, right? That's not the real you. What I see isn't the real you. Now, when I hear you speak, that's the real you. But the real us are going to live forever, right? But these physical bodies, uh, they're just temporary shelters, aren't they? Aren't you glad you're going to get a new body? There's a good place to shout right here. Woo! Can you imagine what your new body's going to be like? Never going to get tired. I don't think we're really going to be hungry, but we're going to eat anyway. I mean, I don't know, I guess maybe God will let us get hungry so we can enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. But uh, we're not going to be hungry out of necessity, put it that way. We're going to eat out of pleasure, and the best part about it, we ain't going to gain the pound. Oh, Jesus. We're just going to be the perfect weight, whatever that is. We're going to be the perfect age. Gus is shouting and sputing and all kind of things back there. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Uh, somebody said, well, what, how old are we going to be in heaven? You know how old I think we're going to be? 33 and a half years old. Because Jesus was what? He was done. He was done with this body at 33. I, I guess we don't really have Bible to say to prove that, but I, how many know 33 was a pretty good year? Some of us can't even remember that far back. I know, it's okay. Trust me, it was a good year. I remember uh, my mom and dad always talking about uh, Poppy Step talking about them taking a, a, a photograph of us kids. We were younger, and he said, hey, that's probably the last best picture you're going to take. <laughs> and I didn't really understand that until we took that about 15 years ago. And, well, yeah, you know which one I'm talking about? We're all in the orange there. I'm, uh, I've got our picture on the bed stand there, and I look at that, and I think, yep, that was our prime right about there. <laughs> Ever since then, it's just been downhill. But how many are going to be thankful for that new body? Man, it's going to be awesome. Brother Gus is going to be dunking it. Ooh. I'm going to be eating all I can. I'm going to be eating all I can and not gaining a pound. Somebody say amen. So don't judge your worth by your dirt. Amen. But now, uh, let's really get back to the beginning here uh, with this question. And the question is this. And man, this is just taking us to Jump Street, square number one. Why did God even create man in the first place? Okay? Why? Why? Why did God create man in the first place? Well, I believe it's safe to say that God wanted a family. How many all want to be part of a family? Sure we do. We love our families. We love our church families and so on and so forth. And guess what? God wanted a family. So much so that he even wanted his children to look like him. Woo! Have you ever thought about that? How many of... How many have children that you can't deny? Where's Brother Joel at? Oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> they just look too much like you to be somebody else's, right? Right? Well, look at this here in Genesis chapter number 1, verse 27. So God created man, how? In his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. 
You want to know what God looks like? I'm about to blow somebody's mind. You want to know what God looks like? Look at your neighbor. You said, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> uh, look at your neighbor and say, man, you look really familiar. I thought I'd seen you somewhere before. No. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. Now, with that being said, that God created both male and female, I want us to understand that in the kingdom of God, there is only sonship. S-O-N-S-H-I-P. There is only sonship. Because how many understand that once we get to heaven, we're not going to be married? There's not going to be the difference like there is here of male and female. Now, don't shout a big hallelujah right now or your spouse is going to... But the truth is, they're just as thankful as you are right now. I mean, But there's only sonship in the kingdom of God. Now, as good little Christians... Oftentimes we think that Jesus was the only son of God. But in all reality, Adam and Eve were sons of God simply because they had no earthly father or mother. How can you not call God their father when they were created by his very hands? Adam and Eve did not have earthly parents. They were sons of God. God himself was their father slash creator. And look how Luke states it here in Luke chapter 3, verse number 38. Luke 3, 38, 338. Which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of who? Adam was the son of God. I didn't say it. Luke said it. Now, let's look at another verse here that shows us we're all a part of the family of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow. There we go to that prophecy thing again. God knew some stuff. In fact, he knows everything. He's omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent, right? For whom he did foreknow. And that right there means we're not here by accident. Hello? Our bishop has said it for years. We're not an accident going somewhere to happen, Right? For whom he did foreknow, he also did what? Predestinate to be conformed to the image of who? His son Jesus. Watch this now. That he might be the what? The firstborn or the big brother among many brethren. Wow. How many knew you had a big brother called Jesus? Woo. How many know what big brothers like to do with their little siblings? They like to watch over them and take care of them. That's it. They like to beat up any bully that comes against their younger siblings, right? <laughs> oh, I love it. Look at this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 6. And has raised us up together. Everybody say together. together. If we're going to be raised up, we've got to be raised up as a body. Remember, we're members in particular. Some of us are an arm, a leg, a shoulder, a knee, whatever we are. It really doesn't matter. We're just part of the body. And so if we're going to be raised up, we've got to be raised up together, and that's why we need unity. And so, has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. How? Not just with, but in Christ Jesus. Ooh, in Christ Jesus. Ask me to explain that? I can't, but I believe. How many believe? So many things about the Bible I can't explain, but I choose to believe. Amen? Amen. Ah. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and tell them, well, we're all part of the family. The family of God. We're a part of the body of Christ. We're part of the family of God. I'm going to show you in a minute that we're sons of God. Watch this. So there, there's, then there's, the, there's only sonship in the kingdom of God. If you remember, Job talked about it. Remember? He said, when the sons, plural... When the sons of God came to present themselves to the Lord. Remember that story, Job chapter 1? So, think about this. From the first son of God, Adam, to the second Adam, Jesus, there were no other sons of God born. None. 
In those 4,000 years, only sons of men were born. So then, because of that, we believe Job is referring to the angels here. Because he said, sons of God. And we'll get to that here in a minute because we got a whole other can of worms to open up about the angels here in a minute. But look at this. Genesis chapter 5, verse number 3. Just stay with me. I know I'm all over everywhere, but just stay with me. We'll tie it all together in the end. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in whose image? Not God's, but his own likeness. Okay, so we see the difference here between Adam and his son. Okay, Adam we can call the son of God, but we can't call Adam's son a son of God because he was born in the likeness of Adam and after his image and called his name Seth. So, no more sons of God, only sons of men were born until Jesus came and defeated the devil and guess what? Sonship was restored. Okay? Here we go. After the cross and after the resurrection, sonship was restored. After Jesus, sons of God were once again being born into the kingdom of God. Let's look at it here. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse number 18 and 19. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in who? In us. In us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestations of the who? The sons of God. All right. I think we need to figure out who the sons of God are. Right? Right? Are they the angels? Are they us? Who are they? All right, stick with me. We'll get back to that here in a minute. Quickly here, let's look at another institution that God created in Genesis. There in the garden, and God was busy in the Garden of Eden. And it's the institution of the family unit. Man and woman who became husband and wife. Let's look at it here in Genesis chapter number 2. And we'll get back to the sonship here in a minute. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone, for I will make him a helpmeet for him. Jump down to verse number 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and stood thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. And now we see that they're not just man and woman, but now we see them becoming husband and wife. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be what? One flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, we, we like to bring this out during weddings oftentimes. When God created Eve, he took a bone out of Adam's side called the rib, right? And he took it out of his side close to his heart because how many know the husband and wife's wife are to share life together? Close to the heart. Notice that he didn't take a bone out of Adam's head that Adam should lord over his wife. Nor did he take a bone out of Adam's foot that Eve should lord over him. But a bone out of his side. That they were joined together. Together. Amen? I love that example. And I just thought that fit well uh, tonight. But marriage has never been a man-made institution. It came from God Himself. And for those who are struggling in your marriage right now, you might think, well, why did God create marriage? <laughs> Come on, somebody, just, just laugh with me. Just roll with me here. But listen, can I tell you that in the beginning, before sin, 
The marriage union was perfect and oh so beautiful. Ooh, now think about it. See, on this side, when we're still dealing with the sin issue, pride, self-centeredness, egotistical, me, myself, and I, we're thinking, man, why did God create this institution of marriage? But before sin, the marriage was perfect. It was holy. I mean, it was the bomb. Look at your neighbor and say, it was the bomb. Yeah. And can I just throw this in there real quick? God's perfect plan for marriage is one man and one woman. One man, one woman. I'm not hating. It's not, you know, it's not condescending. It's not being judgmental. It's God's plan. It's God's plan, okay? And I didn't make it up. I didn't write the rules. We just got to follow, right? So one man, one woman. That's how, it, that's how it happens. Now, look how Paul describes the union of marriage to the church at Ephesus here in Ephesians. So could you imagine what marriage was like before sin? Well, can you imagine what the world was like before sin? Oh, my goodness. Man, wait till we get to heaven. Adam and Eve, hopefully they made it. We're going we're gonna to give them some grief, aren't we? Look at this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 22. Here's how Paul describes a marriage. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. For the, he- the husband is the what? The head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Wow. Now, we could really stop and preach a message just about on every verse here. Verse number 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be uh, to their own husbands in everything. Hmm. Wow. I know. This is tough wording. Husbands, love your wives. And how much are we to love them? even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Wow. Now let me say this. You know, husbands, I know we want our our wives to respect us and honor us and give us, you know, our position of authority. But guess what? If we love them as Christ loved the church, they would probably be apt to give us a little bit more respect. Ladies, you needed to be shouting right about then. Come on. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be what? Holy and without blemish. Wow. So ought men to love their wives. How? As their own bodies. My, my, my. For he that loves his wife loves who? Himself. Wow. Okay. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, because remember the two became one flesh. Remember? No one ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are as members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife. Here it is again, the institution of marriage. And the two shall be one flesh. This is a great what? Mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Wow. So, that's the Apostles Paul definition of marriage. How many know we got some work to do? I'm just saying, amen. Now, let's go back to the point we made about how the marriage union was perfect before sin. And no, we're not going to get all the way through this tonight, but that's all right. We'll find, a, we'll find a landing place here in a few minutes. But let's look at this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. And we're, we're talking about Adam and Eve, man and woman, and then husband and wife. Watch this. Genesis 2, 25. And they, Adam and Eve, were both what? We're both naked. In other words, they didn't have a stitch of clothing on them. The man and his wife, and were not ashamed. 
Ah, okay, well, I wonder why that is. They were both naked, but yet they were not ashamed. And how is that possible? Because shame only comes from sin. There you go. Shame only comes from sin. Adam and Eve never knew they were naked until they sinned. Huh. Isn't that amazing? Adam and Eve never knew they were naked until they sinned. Before they fell, Adam and Eve lived guilt-free, shameless lives. We need to stop right there. Let's just stop about and think about the weight of that. Before sin, before the fall, Adam and Eve lived shame-free, guiltless, sinless, carefree, no burdens, no condemnation, no problems. That was their lifestyle. That was their marriage. And yet they had to eat of that stupid fruit. Well, I tell you what, if they could do over, they would have done over, wouldn't they? Yeah. Yeah, they would have done over. Now, let's look at this real quick, and uh, we'll, we'll bring this to a close for tonight here. Let's look at how innocence was lost. How innocence was lost. Because how many know that really that's, that's what they were? They were totally innocent. But notice here, I, let's, in fact, let's take time to read it. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. I know we know it, but let's read it. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle, or deceiving, conniving, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, this is the serpent speaking, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the tree, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, is that really what God said? It's not what he said, is it? How many know secondhand knowledge, you've got to watch out for that kind of stuff? Because I don't think Eve was there when God told Adam. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't, I don't know. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Hmm. And when the woman saw that the, free, the, food, the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, how many know sin always looks desirous? The tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her, her husband with her, and he did eat. Now we know that Eve was deceived. But why did Adam eat of it? Was he deceived or was he just, well, you know what, if she's going to be judged for this, I guess we're both going to be judged. I don't know. And the eyes of them both were open. Oh, all of a sudden they see things now in a new light. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. How many know that was the first religious spirit right there? That was the first act of religion right there. Oh, I got to get right. I got to try to cover my sin. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded that you uh, should not eat? And the man said, the woman. It's her fault. How many know we're still blaming the woman, right? <laughs> and the man said, the woman who thou gavest to me, with me, she gave me of the tree and did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat it. So Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the serpent. Isn't that just like our human nature? <laughs> but this is the point I want to bring out, and we'll close for tonight. Notice here how the serpent did not tempt Adam and Eve to steal, to kill, to do something crazy, 
No, he just simply tempted them to question God's word. Half God said. Half God said. And this is so important because oftentimes God's word and his instruction will go against human logic. How many have found that to be true? Right? Speak to the rock and water will come out of it. That ain't logical. March around the city seven days. And on the seventh day, march around it seven times and the walls will, will fall. That's not logic. Step into the Jordan River and the waters will recede. That's not logic. Put your hand in the water and the axe head will float to the top. That's not logic. Dip, your time, dip seven times in the Jordan River and your leprosy will be made healed. How many know we don't serve a logic kind of God? But we serve a supernatural God. How many would say amen? Woo! You see, even though the word of God or the instruction of the Lord oftentimes seems illogical, just believe. Just believe and just do it. Amen? Exercise that childlike faith, that measure of faith. So the devil was able to cause Adam and Eve to sin simply by creating doubt about what God had said. So that tells me we better know what does say at the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. Let me see how I want to close this here. Ah. Yeah, we got to go back and, and touch this real quick. So, this is when sin in, entered the world, when Adam and Eve sinned. Sin entered the world and innocence was lost. Sonship was lost. Communion with God was lost. Relationship with God was lost. Perfect marriages were lost. Perfect everything was lost. And let me just say this. Oh, my goodness. I have a hard time quitting, don't I? Remember, Adam and Eve were perfect, sinless, guiltless. They lived in a perfect environment, in a perfect world, yet they still fell prey to the enemy. Now, what does that say to us who are imperfect vessels? Hello? We're all sinners saved by grace, right? Because of Adam, sin nature is in us. Who live in a not perfect world. How many understand we don't live in a perfect world? And yet somehow we think we can beat the devil in our own strength, our own power? Not going to happen. It's not going to happen. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. How many would say amen? Uh, I'll say this. I sure hope Adam and Eve enjoyed their fruit. Because it sure has caused a lot of pain, sorrow, suffering, hell, torment, and even death. Amen? And let me say this. How many understand that the reason why God kicked Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve out of the garden, it just wasn't part of their punishment. But how many understand he had to hurry up and get them out of the garden before they ate of the tree of life? Because guess what? If they ate of the tree of, of good and knowledge, you know they were going to eat of the tree of life. And you know what would have happened then? They would have, been li- they would have lived forever in a state of sin and rebellion. Woo, aren't you glad God threw them out? Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Man, I'm so thankful God threw them out. Because what he knows our human nature, doesn't he? All right, let me just say this and then we'll quit. Oh, man, I just got so many good things I want to bring out here. But quickly, let's look at this. Because this ties into the sin part, the loss of innocence. The very first sacrifice ever made for sin was made by God himself. And it's not what you think. It's not Jesus. The very first sacrifice made for sin was made by God himself right after Adam and Eve sinned. And here it is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. He said, you know what? Your fig leaves aren't good enough. Your religion isn't good enough. Come on, somebody. Let me cover you because now we all know you're naked. You're sin. Now we see your sin. Cover it up. But he said, you know what? Your religion ain't good enough. Let me cover it up. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and he clothed them. Well, guess where God got the coats of skin from? An animal. There it is. Adam and Eve sinned, so God had to kill an animal to cover up their nakedness. That was the first, very first sacrifice for sin. 
God himself performed it. Remember what the Bible says? That without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Can somebody say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Let's, let's stand together. I think that's a good place to stop. Brother Jordan, if you'll mark where we're at right now, and then we'll pick it up next week. If you'll just make a notation of where we're at in the slide, please. Sister Donna, don't ask me no hard question. <laughs> I know how this woman thinks right here. Yes. Ooh. Wow. House divided. House divided. That's true. Wow. That's good. Sin has a way of dividing us, doesn't it? That's, that is a good question. That is a very good question. Yeah, I don't know, but we know we're dealing with 2,000 years of time, so it could have been a good period of time. We don't know. And if, if anybody can find the answer between now and next week, you let us know. Amen? That's, that's good. That makes us, I want to make us think. And we're spending hours and hours and hours, and we're using our book as a guide, but that just gets me going, and that leads one thing to another. And so we're just studying here and there. Brother Ken has gave me a lot of material. Pastor Josh has gave me some material. And so we're just spending hours trying to find uh, the best way to deal with this study. But we have just a short way to go here through. Let me see. Let me count my pages here. One, two, three, four. I have about four pages left of Genesis. So we will finish up, finish up next week with Genesis, and then we will start uh, with Exodus next week as well. All right? All right. Are you enjoying our lesson? Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for your word. We know, Lord, that we're, we're going to pray this a lot on Wednesday nights, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Lord, your word have we hid in our hearts so when the evil day comes, we will not sin against you. God, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And Lord, I just pray, Father, that as we dig into your word here on Wednesday nights, God, that you would just give us a supernatural hunger and a thirst once again for your word. God, that we would fall in love again with this book called the Bible. God, that we would just make time in the morning and the evenings and at noontime on our breaks whenever we can. God, that we can just... Lord, now we have the uh, convenience of it being on our phones. Lord, we don't even have to carry the big King James Bible around anymore. Lord, we can just whip out our phone and, and read the Word. And Lord, just help us to fall in love with Your Word again. God, just do something uh, out of this Wednesday night study, God, that will create a hunger and a thirst, God, for Your truth and for divine revelation and lord now we just lift up every need here tonight that is represented lord physically mentally spiritually emotionally financially god whatever it is lord if those there if those uh, here tonight that are in need of a physical touch we're just asking you to heal and restore and renew and revive and convict and convince can we just link up with our brothers and sisters right here father we just thank you for the family of god we thank you that we are the body of christ Lord, we thank you that we are the sons of God. <laughs> we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Lord, we're not an accident going somewhere to happen. Lord, we're not orphans, but we're sons of God. And we thank you, Father, for divine revelation. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you teach us all things. Holy Ghost, we thank you that you are the paraclete. We thank you for that divine supernatural revelation. And Father, just strengthen us tonight. Encourage us, Lord, here on this Wednesday night. Lord, as we're midway through the week here, looking forward to Sunday, I pray that you would just strengthen us, encourage us at school, at work, at home, uh, on the job, in the grocery store, wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, God, that you would strengthen us the rest of this week to finish out strong. God, I pray whatever situations we're facing, God, at home or at work or at school or in our marriages or in our finances, God, that you would just meet those needs, that you would make a way where there is no way. God, I just thank you that you're the restorer. And God, as we've seen that life was perfect before the fall, 
God, that this world was perfect before sin. God, that marriages were perfect before sin. God, that's where we want to get back to, God. We want to get back to your perfect plan for our lives. God, we want to walk in the full